Mr. President, two and a half years into your presidency, what's been the biggest learning curve? What's been your biggest frustration? So I think probably in terms of a uh, learning curve, it's a little patience. It doesn't go as quickly as it can do and as you do in private, but uh, not that much different than I expected. We've accomplished a lot. I think, you know, I go around saying, Steve, that we've accomplished uh, more maybe than any president has in two and a half years, but I've loved every minute of it. We've had fun. I think the uh, biggest frustration is the uh, the way the media covers me, uh, the way that media covers perhaps this agenda, uh, and I'm disappointed by it. I'm very surprised by it. Uh, generally, I think over my lifetime, I've gotten pretty good press, and here, no matter how big a victory, they really cover it incorrectly, and, you know, hence the term fake news, et cetera, et cetera. I'd say that's been somewhat of a disappointment. I thought that after I won, I was covered, I thought, very poorly during the campaign. I thought after I won, they'd be different, and actually, they've probably gotten worse. So that would be somewhat of a disappointment to me. What is fake news? Well, when you do something and they report it incorrectly, and the problem is that I would know and the public wouldn't, although I think the public, a lot of the public believes me when I say it. So I would know what happened. And when they cover it knowing what I know, but they cover it incorrectly, that to me is fake news. And it's unfortunate that it takes place, but it does. And at a level that I wouldn't be believed. And also with frequency. It's pretty amazing, actually. I went back to your book, The Art of the Deal, and you wrote, quote, most people are surprised by the way I work. I prefer to come to work each day and just see what develops. Do you take that same approach or do you adjust that? Well, I think I do. I think, you know, you get in and I say, what's the event of the day? What's going on? Who's calling? What's happening? And my life has uh, been a pretty rapid, you know, I've seen a lot of changes, a lot of rapid changes. I see it certainly in the White House. You come in and everything is going great, and then you find out that there's a tremendous conflict with another nation. You know, big stuff. Uh, there's uh, something happened with respect to another country, or something happened with respect to a tragedy that takes place. I mean, things happen when you're president, and I take it uh, very seriously. So, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, you have to see what happens that morning. You have to see what happens that evening. No question about it. What was your most difficult day thus far? Well, we've had a lot. I mean, you know, when you have uh, a school shooting, it's tremendously, uh, it angers me, actually. It really angers me. Uh, it frustrates everybody. You say, how could a thing like this happen? How is it possible? When you see innocent children being killed, teachers, uh, that's something that you just never can really get over. And you say, is there something we can do? What can we do? What can, you know, because there's so many different sides to it. What can we do? Uh, well, you can do uh, a lot of the things that we've done. You know, we did a report. The Florida shooting was horrible. And for some reason, that group of people, they're terrific. I got to be friendly with a lot of them. And we did a report, and they really appreciated the report. We, I, we did it with them and with experts. And uh, I'm going to give you a copy of it, because I'd like to oh, actually have another meeting. I think it was really comprehensive, really good. Uh, and, you know, there were a lot of red flags with that shooter. I think they said there were 36 red flags. And you're pretty disappointed. You know what I mean by a red flag. In other words, there were warnings out there. This was not a Boy Scout. And people didn't do what they should have done. And now there are other cases where there are no warnings whatsoever. It comes out of the blue. Maybe in certain ways, that's almost more frustrating, because you'd say, how could a thing like this happen? So uh, those are events that really are uh, they're very tough to take when you're the president of a country. You've talked a lot about Baltimore in the last 48 hours. I have. It's not the record that you have with with African Americans, but it's the rhetoric that we've been seeing. And I want to go back to what you said on election night. You say, now it's the time for America to bind the wounds of division. I say it's time for us to come together as one united people. I pledge to every citizen of our land that I will be president for all Americans. It's true. And I mean it maybe even more now than I meant it then. But there is a tremendous divide between Republicans and Democrats, between 
ideologies, you know, whether it's healthcare. I listened to some of the healthcare plans that would be so destructive, and uh, you see what we're doing, and you see what, you know, when you want to take 180 million people off uh, private health insurance, where they love it. They just love it. They fought for it. They want it. They work hard for it, and, you know, you want to take it away from them. There's a divide, and that's one of many things. And I'm actually surprised by, you know, the level. It's Look, it was here for President Obama. It was here for President Bush. It was certainly here for President Clinton, if you go back. Uh, but there is a divide. There's no question about it. And I think it can change. I really do. It, it started on a bad foot when, you know, this whole hoax was created with the Russian hoax today. You see there, somebody even said it with respect to Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell uh, could not care less about Russia. It's, you know, when they start, they throw out these phrases and they think it's wonderful and they say, let's play it. Uh, I do believe that there's a chance that we can do something. I probably, it would be in a second term. I really think we could probably do something and a lot better. That would be one of the things that I'm a little bit surprised at. I thought that'd be better unity. We're accomplishing a lot. We're getting what we want. The military is being rebuilt. The tax cuts we got. Uh, the regulation cuts are the biggest of any president in history, even if it was a much longer term of years. But uh, with all of the things that we've got, I mean, think of VA choice, think of all of the things that we've got, uh, you would think that that would make people happy. Uh, but they, but they are, read the tweets. Do you think that, you, that you're a uniter as president? Well, you know, if I got fair coverage, I wouldn't even have to tweet. It's my only form of defense. Uh, if the press covered me fairly, I wouldn't need that. But they don't cover me fairly. For instance, today I was in Jamestown. I made a, a, a speech that was said to be a very good speech. It was not a political speech at all. It talked about 400 years ago. I mean, it was an amazing, very important period of time. And there was one protester stood up. And he stood up and he held up a sign and he said whatever he said, something. He got more publicity than the speech got. Now, I don't need publicity, Steve, at all. But I, I just thought it was so terrible. And it was on Fox with John Roberts. And he talked about the protester for almost the entire segment of that. And I said, isn't that a shame? One guy stands up, not an impressive person. He stood up and he got all of this. He took the whole thing away. One person. It wasn't like, gee, we have 25,000 people going crazy. There was one person. And I say, that's pretty sad. We cover your rallies in yes. their entirety. We'll you be with you Thursday in Cincinnati. You do. When you're standing behind the podium looking at that crowd, what are you thinking? Well, for one thing, I'm thinking that never in the history of politics has that happened, and you understand what I mean, because I've never had an empty seat. I don't believe from the beginning, from the time I came down the escalator, and I think, you know, because you do cover it really well, one of the reasons I'm doing the interview, respect for you and also the fact that you do really do a good job of covering the rallies. But others cover the rallies, too. Uh, I don't think we've had an empty seat. I don't think you've seen an empty seat. We have thousands of people outside. And sometimes we take ads or we, we communicate, please don't come. Think of it. We'll have a 22,000-seat arena, including like a basketball, an NBA arena, or even bigger, stadiums. We've never had an empty seat. And when you think about that, it's never happened before. When you look at, I saw Biden's opening where he couldn't get 150 people to an opening in a little basketball high school gymnasium. And it's a very unique thing. I, I will tell you, people are surprised that I look comfortable. But there's such love in those arenas, there's such love in those stadiums and those rooms that I speak in. It's really not hard. It's, it's very, it's hard to explain that to people. I have friends that are very successful. They say, how do you get up? And much of it is not even, you know, sometimes I'll have a teleprompter or I'll have some notes or something, but much of it's just off the cuff because there's tremendous love in those rooms. There's an amazing, and I'm sure that you see that, it's an incredible love. And I have to say that I believe that it's stronger now than it was even Election Day in 16. I really believe it's stronger now than I've ever seen it before. When Congressman Elijah Cummings calls you a racist, your reaction is what? Well, I think the word has really gone down a long way because everybody's called a racist now. Uh, her own party called Nancy Pelosi a racist two weeks ago. 
Uh, the word is so overused, it's such a disgrace. And I can tell you, I'm the least racist person there is in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And they use it almost when they run out of things to criticize you. They say, he's a racist, he's a racist. Now, in some cases, it's true. There are people that are racist, bad people. But with me, uh, <laughs> they have a hard time getting away with it, and they don't get away with it. And if you look at what I've done for African Americans between uh, I mean, look at criminal justice reform. President Obama tried so hard to get it, he couldn't get it. You look at opportunity zones, and then, of course, look at the opportunity zones are a tremendous success, by the way, not covered. But we did that as really an experiment. It's the most successful. I think it's one of the most successful things ever done for the inner cities. It's turned out to be Tim Scott of South Carolina worked very, very hard on it. Uh, so many other people did, and it's really become a great success. The biggest beneficiary are African-American. The African-American population, they, it's incredible what's happened. But between that criminal justice reform, and then, of course, the biggest thing is the lowest uh, unemployment rate in the history of this country for African-Americans. Lowest in the history by far. It's not even close. But so when you, when you see those things, and when people, I mean, if, if the news the lamestream or mainstream or whatever you want to call it, media, or fake news, if it would be covered, uh, people would feel a lot different. But they don't talk about that. They don't talk about opportunity zones. I don't think I've ever seen anything about opportunity zones. I don't think I've seen, you know, when I did uh, criminal justice reform, everybody would say, oh, I, I won't tell you names because I'm not looking to build them up. But the biggest names were there on the other side, liberal side and conservative side. It was very bipartisan. But they don't even talk about it anymore. If somebody else did it, if President Obama did criminal justice reform, which is so good for the African Americans, so good, so important, you know, like letting Alice out, getting our shit, 28 years left to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack Johnson, who was so unjustly convicted, the great heavyweight champion from the early 1900s. I mean, so many things we've done. Um, when, if, if President Obama did that, it would have been great. But when I do it, when I do it, Steve, when I do it, people don't want to talk about it. Well, there's a Quinnipiac poll that said 80% of African Americans believe that your rhetoric is racist. So what do you, why is that message not getting out? Because the press doesn't put what I've accomplished for African Americans out. They really don't. They don't talk about criminal justice reform. I did it. It was hard to do, too. I had to get people that really, I had to really twist arms. It was hard to get some of the people. And we got it. It's you know, being hailed in certain, many people hail it, they talk about it, but they don't even mention that I had anything to do with it. It couldn't have happened without me. I was the one that, that was able to get it done. Um, so if the press treated me fairly, it's, I don't want to complain. In the meantime, I'm president, right? So, you know, how bad can it be? But the truth is, if I wasn't able to get out my own message, it would, I would not be elected anything uh, because the press is very unfair. now. If the press did treat me fairly, I'd have tremendous support from the African-American communities. You know, when Kanye West comes out and supports me, it has a big impact. Uh, Jim Brown, uh, I have so much support. Evander Holyfield, Mike Tyson, so many of these, the, the really representatives, athletes, and, and so many more, so many more. Uh, but when Kanye did it, it was very interesting because my numbers went really, I, you probably saw, they, they really we covered it. Up. Well, the, the interesting thing is people heard. They said, well, wait a minute. The, we didn't know this about President Trump. But that's the facts. That's the way it is. And when I, like, for instance, I'm doing an interview with you, people seeing that, well, they're going to say, well, I didn't know he did criminal justice reform. That was a Clinton thing that was horrible. And Biden, it was horrible for African Americans. I'm the one that opened it up and got it unclogged. It was a terrible situation where people were going to jail for 50 years over something that, in some cases, wouldn't even be, you know, thought of for, for a year or six months or, in some cases, for nothing today. So it was a very unfair thing. I'm proud of it. But, you know, I get people don't talk about it. The media doesn't talk about it. As you know, John, Kennedy, John Kennedy relied on Dwight Eisenhower. George W. Bush relied on his father. Bill Clinton relied on Richard Nixon. Have you reached out to former presidents? And if so, who and why? Not too much. Uh, I mean, I speak with uh, George Bush, uh, spoke a little bit to the father. 
but really not too much. I mean, it's, it's hard when people were against you. I, I very much disagreed with the war in Iraq, so it's hard to say that, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, all of a sudden I can forget that. I mean, I'm in a situation where we're in the Middle East. Uh, we're, uh, we've defeated, as you know, the caliphate in Syria. We did, I did that because I did that. I wanted to do that, and we did it 100 percent of the caliphate. When I was at 99 percent, people said, Oh, you can't pull out, you can't pull out. Well, when I took it over, it was a mess. Anyway, I defeated 100 percent caliphate. That doesn't mean ISIS doesn't go running around bombing a store and doing what they do because they're stone cold crazy. But we've done a great job. But, you know, I disagreed very strongly on having gone into the Middle East. We're in there now for more than $7 trillion, thousands of lives, millions of lives. You have to count both sides, because I actually count both sides. Millions of lives. And they went into a country that did not knock down the World Trade Center, okay? They didn't knock down. It was not Iraq, and it was not Saddam Hussein. He had plenty of problems, okay? He was not a good person, but he didn't knock down the World Trade Center. So we got stuck in this quicksand, but we're extricating ourselves and we're getting out. I call them the endless wars. The endless wars have to end. And we're doing very well, and our military is being built up at a level that has never been built before. When I took over our military, it was depleted, totally depleted. And now it's being, you know, big numbers, but those numbers are more important to me than almost any numbers. Because if we don't have protection from bad actors, then we're going to be in big trouble. But all of that is coming at a price. So back in 2011, you tweeted, I cannot believe the Republicans are extending the debt ceiling. I encourage them to stop this. It's an embarrassment. And yet That's your spending is going to be far exceeding what Barack Obama well, does, and okay. another $2 trillion in the debt. Sure, but the difference is he wasn't building up the military. The military was getting depleted. I have to build it up, and I have to build it up from both Bush and from Obama, because with Bush, you know, we were in these wars all over the place. And with Obama, the same thing. They just never ended. Uh, you look at Afghanistan, we're spending $50 billion a year, $50 billion. Now, we've pulled back a lot. I mean, I don't know if you know that, but we have, and we're Do continuing we to. Well, we're going to see. We're working on negotiating a deal right now, as you probably have heard. And, uh, you know, at some point, we want to get out as quickly as we can. Uh, but uh, Afghanistan is one thing, and with Syria, we're just about out, as you know. We defeated the caliphate, and we're just about out. And, no, I want to get out of these crazy wars that we should have never been in. We shouldn't have been in these wars. These wars are are wars we could have done great damage through intelligence and other things and not having gotten in. Now, at the same time, I want to have the strongest military on the planet Earth, and we do. We now do. When I got here, it was really in bad shape. It was — I can't even tell you how bad it was. And now we have new fighter jets. We have new missiles. We have — our nuclear has been totally renovated, fixed, and in some cases made brand new. We have tremendous submarines that we are building right now, tremendously powerful submarines, nuclear submarines. And a lot of good things are happening. I think we're going to end up making a deal with Russia where we have some kind of an arms control, because all we're doing is uh, adding on to what we don't need, and they are, too. Uh, China is trying to catch us both. Right now, it would be us, then Russia, and then China. But China is actually way behind. But uh, they're trying to catch us. And, you know, one of the things I've done is, uh, China had the worst year they've had in 27 years. I was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, Steve. And uh, they are not, you know, they're not doing too well right now. We're tariffing them. We're taking in many, many billions of dollars. I'm taking care of our farmers out of those tariffs because China hit them as a way of retaliating against President Trump. And I said, I'll tell you, our farmers are great patriots. They're incredible. And our farmers are going to be the ultimately the biggest beneficiary. So a lot of good things are happening with respect to that. You know, we're talking to China right now. But really, it's going to be up to me. I — we cannot let China do what they've done to us over the last 25 years. They've taken hundreds of billions of dollars out of our country every single year. Hundreds of billions, with a B, not millions, billions. But you think you can reach a deal? I think I can reach a deal if I want to. I think they're right now hurting. The tariffs are killing them. Companies are moving out of China. They're going all over, including they're coming here, by the way, because they don't want to pay the tariffs. And, yeah, I think I can reach a deal, absolutely. Let me follow up on two real quick points. First of all, you've issued 43,000 tweets. Did you ever regret sending one out? Not much, you know, honestly, not much. Uh, I sent the one about the uh, 
wiretapping, uh, in quotes, uh, and that turned out to be true. Remember the big deal that was? I heard, like, about a minute after I sent it, I, I was called by my people, sir, did you say? I said, yeah, I did. What's the big deal? And the reason it was such a big deal is it turned out to be true. Um, I guess you could say a lot of the times the, the bigger problem, the retweets. You know, you'll retweet something that sounds good, but it turned out to be from a player that's not the best player in the world. That sort of causes a problem. But overall, I would say no, not at all. I think it's a, a modern-day form of communication. And it's not really tweet. That's a typewriter. What it really is is, as soon as I do it, you put it on, everybody puts it on. It's breaking news. We have Every time I put out a tweet, even if it's good morning, everybody, they say, we have breaking news. The president has just said good morning. It's, uh, it's an incredible way of communicating, and you get it out fast. Otherwise, I mean, I don't know, how would I combat news that's dishonest? How would I combat a reporter or a, a network that's totally dishonest? CNN is, it's, you know, it's 100 percent negative. NBC is negative. I made a lot of money for NBC with The Apprentice. It was a tremendous success at a time when they didn't have any successes. But they forgot about that very quickly. So, and they wanted to extend me. They wanted to do anything. I wanted to run for president. I think we've done a great job. The country's right now on the right path. And I think we have tremendous potential. You know, you take a look at the European Union, that's doing poorly. You take a look at China, it's doing really poorly. You take a look at other countries, they're not doing well. We're the hottest country in the world. We're doing great economically and otherwise. We now have a very strong military, a lot stronger after this last budget. And then at some point, very soon, I'll be able to cut back. But we had to rebuild our military. We didn't have a choice. You know, it's wonderful to say we have a balanced budget. But if we can't protect ourselves, having a balanced budget doesn't mean anything. Final question. As you approach this job in a day in the presidency here in the White House, walk us through that day. Well, I, I stay up late. I like to read a lot, which is people don't understand that, but I do read a lot. I also watch a lot. I, I sometimes I'll, A lot of Fox? I, I watch a lot of Fox. I tend to not watch too much of CNN because, I mean, I'll, I, it's, it's just... It's just such incorrect reporting. That's why their ratings went down so low. Although I'll be watching the debates tonight. You know, I, if I didn't, you'd say, I can't imagine. <laughs> you know, I would like to know who I'm going to be running against. Maybe you'll tell me after this interview, right? You tell but me. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I would think the four or five top ones would seem to have a big edge. You have some people that shouldn't even be wasting time. But I would think the four or five top ones would be the ones that would be, uh, you know, certainly have the best chance of getting in. There's a picture of your dad in the credenza in the Oval right. Office. Right. Would he be surprised that you're president today? Well, he was always very uh, proud of me. I did, you know, I went to schools. I did well. He, he just was very proud of me. Um, and. I came into his business. He was a man that never let anyone sign a check. And when I came in, I could sign checks. You know, he was just a very strong guy who just, you know, was a very dominant figure and yet a very good man. He was a very good person. He had tremendous heart, but a strong person. Um, he'd be only surprised in that he never thought I'd be running for politics, you know, for office. I think if I said I was going to run for president, I think he'd probably say I'd have a chance at doing it. Uh, so he never got to see this, unfortunately. He died a little while before, but uh, he was 93, uh, and he led a good life. He was a good, good man, great mother, great father, great brothers and sisters. But uh, so that way I was very, very lucky. But I think my father would say that if I, if I wanted to run, I think he probably said I would have done very well. Now, who knew this was exactly going to happen? Who can say that? I mean, you have political families that Everybody thinks they're going to do great, and they didn't do so great. But uh, my father would have been very proud. He loved this country, and he had confidence in me. Your big agenda in a second term would be what? Well, I think uh, getting costs, uh, now that the military is very close to being totally rebuilt, I think uh, costs are going to be a big factor. Uh, we want to strengthen up Social Security so that nobody gets hurt later on. I'm going to strengthen a lot of the things up that really, I think we're going to do very strong health care, very, very strong health care. It's very, very important to me because you don't have, Obamacare is not good. We've managed Obamacare really well. And I had a decision to make. Do I manage it well or do I manage it purposely poorly? Politically, I should have managed it poorly, but we've managed it really well, much better than they managed it. 
it's still too expensive and it's still not good health care. So we're going to make something really good, and I will leave that for the beginning of my second term. If we can win the House, the Senate, and the presidency, we will have health care that's going to be phenomenal. And many other things. We have a lot of things to do. And, uh, but but just to be lot. on the record, some budget cuts are in the works potentially in a second. Oh, absolutely, sure. We'll be we'll be talking. Well, just in terms of the military, once we you know a lot of this money, Steve, is going to rebuilding, is ordering new planes. You know, after you have a certain number of planes, they last for a long time. We had planes that were 45, 50 years old. You know the story you've reported on it, right? Where the grandfather flew the same plane as the young grandson that's now flying, okay? I mean, we had old equipment. We were getting parts from the graveyard in the desert, the plane graveyard, where they had the old, they don't make the parts anymore. They were getting, it's ridiculous. Now we have brand new F-35s and F-18s, and we have the best missile systems in the world, new Patriots, new Tomahawks, uh, the best submarines. Nobody's even close in submarine technology to us. And no, we have phenomenal stuff. We have aircraft carriers coming on. We have the President Gerald Ford, coming on, and uh, it's out on sea trials right now. So we have a lot of really great things happening. Mr. President, we thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Great honor. Thank you.